Happy Saturday, everybody. I am Nick Slavic. I am the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. I'm also the host of this show, Ask a Painter Live. It's a weekly live Facebook show where I use my almost three decades of experience as a master craftsperson and a paint business entrepreneur to sort of showcase the life of what it is to own a painting business and, and practice the craft. So today we're going to be going over the basics of staining and varnishing. And of course, any topic, any question you guys want to talk about or, or ask, just put it in the comments below and we'll get to it after this. Uh, our friends at Minwax today have given me another assignment and they said, Nick, go through our performance line, uh, pick out the things you like and apply them to your standard operating procedure and show us how it all works together. So I'm gonna talk about stain matching. I'm gonna talk about the basics of staining. I'm gonna talk about the basics of varnishing and why I choose the products that I do. But first we have some, um, we got some events to mention. So after two years of kind of not doing events, we're back to doing events for the PCA, the Painting Contractors Association. If you have not heard about the PCA, the Painting Contractors Association's mission is to build better contractors. So how do they do that? So number one, they have industry standards. Have you ever wondered what a properly finished wall is and what the standard is for that and what you can hold your builders and clients and yourself accountable to? That is a standard and those are actually free right now. You can go on the PCA's website. Um, we have painter training. So there is an insanely robust series of videos, both in English and native Spanish speaking, uh, about how to train your painters. So as a paint business owner, if you want some supplemental videos, uh, some training uh, processes, and some and, and, and LMS, a learning management system with quizzes and modules and things like that, that is there for members as well. Now, launching this fall is uh, Jason Paris's and my pet project, which is the Business Accelerator, where we take all the lessons learned in growing our businesses, helping our people, supporting our people, developing our people, and we put that into another series of training videos from subject matter experts from around the industry. That will be released this fall. There will be a learning management system with that, quizzes, modules, uh, a progression, and uh, we're gonna, so many things to come. I don't wanna get too ahead of myself, but that'll be launching this fall. So basically, when you go to the PCA, we want to build better contractors. That means mastering the craft, like things we're going to do today. But it also means mastering the business side so that you're able to run a profitable business so that you can pay your people well, give them health insurance, retirement, paid time off, all the good stuff, but then also be able to practice the craft. So uh, businesses don't exist without making a profit and uh, providing good uh, products to their clients. And that's what that thing is all about. Now, events. After two years uh, of a COVID landscape, we, uh, events kind of went away for a little bit. But as you guys have seen, I've been traveling. We've been going to Sherwin Williams Pro Shows. We've been going to see people around the country again. And there is a robust list of uh, events going on. The next big one I want on your calendar is June 22nd, June 23rd on our home turf. Uh, Jason Paris, all his friends at Olive Holdings, his business partners, and myself are putting on an event called PBN, Paint by Numbers. It is an amazing two-day workshop. It's a lab where you bring your uh, people, you bring yourself, and basically Jason and the Olive guys open up their business to you and show you exactly how they do what they do. I will be there uh, with a master's class. I think Jason and I are actually going to present a master's class together, which is insanely fun. Uh, we did this at the expo. Uh, I don't know if you guys were there or not, but it was an amazing time and uh, we had a blast. So events also, Ask a Painter Live Summer Retreat is in August. We're accepting applications. There is a link uh, for not only PBN, but for the Ask a Painter Live Retreat, but then also every other PCA event for the next year. Now, I would urge you to check the PCA events page weekly because there are events being added daily as we speak, as they uh, come to fruition. So, okay. Now, let's dig into the basics of staining and varnishing. So in, in a world where we have been enameling cabinets like crazy for the last, I don't know, decade, give or take, uh, the last proliferation of housing was probably around 2003 to 2008, give or take. Big housing boom in the United States, especially in our area here. All the houses were built with tan walls and golden oak woodwork. Almost every single one of them. There was almost no painted woodwork at all in those houses. And now, 15, 20 years later, we're looking at painting all of that wood. And um, it's been really interesting because we've been going deep on like primer, enamel systems, things like that. But sometimes we forget that a large portion of what we do and what we've done in the past has been staining and varnishing. And in my business now, we don't do as much staining and varnishing as we did in the past, but uh, we can't let that skill die because all these things are cyclical and uh, we're gonna find that um, staining and varnishing versus enameling is going to ebb and flow over the years. So 
One thing that I wanted to show you was there is a monstrous amount of stains and varnishes out there. And a lot of them are actually, um, you know, uh, pretty readily available uh, to the DIYer. There's a whole bunch of great products out there. The problem with that is there's so many, sometimes it's hard to choose. And I look, uh, my criteria for finding a great sign of kind of staining and varnishing system is number one, readily available. Number two, I don't want it going away. So there's all sorts of crazy stuff, especially being a, a historic woodworker, historic wood finisher. There's all sorts of crazy um, chemistry formulas, things that we can make on our own, but it's all one off and it's hard to teach other people and it's everything's custom. So what I want for my people, you know, we're known for the decent human being, uh, being theory and the apprenticeship. We bring a whole bunch of really young, inspired people in that are learning the trade and I want to make it easy for them. I want them to get a really good finish. I want them to enjoy their work. I don't want it ultra complicated. So readily available, which means Minwax Performance Series, this stuff, Minwax is not going away. And uh, this Performance Series is available at Sherwin-Williams. Sherwin-Williams is not going away and you can get it everywhere. There are uh, uh, dozens and dozens of stores in my area. And if you need any product, it's there for you. So that's very important to me as well. If we have to mail order stuff in, it makes the process just a little more clunky, especially if you have to mail order in, uh, in the winter in Minnesota, which is not that fun. So uh, it's got to be readily available. Uh, it can't be going away. Um, the price, I don't really care about the price that much, is especially on a staining and varnishing project. You may only use a quarter or a gallon of stain or varnish. It goes forever. So really, this is buy the ultra premium stuff, buy the best stuff you can. Price is not really a factor. Um, I want ease of use and application. Uh, I want some nice open time on my stain uh, so it doesn't get blotchy. I want it to dry fast as well. Uh, and also I want no surprises. So there's also there's all sorts of stuff out there with wild amounts of chemistry. Uh, stuff that's very touchy with temperature, humidity, mixing ratios, cross linkers, uh, additives, things like that. Again, I like simplicity. Simplicity is one of the hallmarks of what we do here at my company. So I want something where you open this can and you apply it and you let it dry. You open this can, you apply it and you let it dry. That's what we're talking about. I don't want any more variables than that in there. Uh, our, our craft is a beautiful thing and sometimes we complicate it more than it should be. So my basic process for staining and varnishing is one coat of stain, two coats of varnish. And I always try to do that. Like, yes, there's toners, there's dyes, uh, there's all sorts of shading, uh, sanding sealers, this and that. They're great, I love them, they all work well. But again, simplicity. My goal, when, I, when a client comes up and says, hey, we wanna try a really cool finish, how about like a navy blue stain? I will say, okay, here's my parameters. Give me a week or two to work on it. I'm gonna come up with a sample like this for you. And I'm gonna try to get it in a one application stain and a two application finish. So let's talk about the stain matching process before we get into this stuff. Um, one of the things I like about Minwax Performance Series is that this is tintable. Uh, we know and love uh, the, the, the flagship Minwax stains, interior stains. I particularly like them. Uh, they are uh, still solvent based and they have a long open time, which means they stay wet longer. I find that that reduces blotching. Uh, it reduces drying and lap marks when you're doing really complex, like large passage doors and things like that. Uh, and it's, they're easily wipeable then too. So uh, a lot of people like uh, water-based stains. Minwax has those too, they're great. I'm still a big fan of the solvent borne stuff. Um, I just feel that, you know, yes, probably in my lifetime, a lot of solvents will be changed or gone or hybridized or things like that. But for any of you who have been around a long time, if uh, I, I appreciate water-based wood finishes, they definitely have a place. We can operate with them at a very high level. There's something beautiful and remarkable about a solvent-based stain and a solvent-based varnish, uh, a solvent-based varnish on wood. It adds depth, interest, warmth, character, and it plays with the wood a lot better than a lot of the water-based stuff, at least in my mind, for an aesthetic reason. I can make a solvent-based system last a lifetime. I can make a water-based system last a lifetime, but there is a difference in the aesthetic, and we have to be careful to uh, translate that to our clients. So, all right, I'm seeing you guys. Uh, uh, post the comments and the questions and stuff. Uh, after this, we will get to that, no problem. So one of the cool things that I do is, you know, a client can send me a picture uh, of something they're using and I take some wood. This happens to be poplar. Uh, I use this for a specific reason, which is this is a, technically it's kind of a scrap wood. It's it's right on the edge of, you know, you have soft woods like pine, hardwoods like oak. This one's kind of like right in the middle, technically kind of a soft wood, but it's just bordering on hardwood. This used to be uh, used historically for like the insides of dressers, the scrap wood, the things you don't see. 
But what is expensive and clients, when they build their houses and do their projects, they don't necessarily want to spend a bunch of money on really good wood. They, we almost never get a chance to finish hardwood anymore. The most common finish we get asked to do is poplar and stain very, very dark. And that's why I picked a, a navy blue example today, just because it's kind of fun to do. Um, and obviously, the softer the wood, the more blotching there is going to be on there. So we have to do a series of tests. And uh, my goal is usually not to get rid of blotching, because if you pick poplar, you will get blotching no matter what. And instead of trying to get rid of the blotching, which you won't do, um, what I do is set proper expectations with the clients, which is show me a picture, show me a sample of what you want. Then I go get the wood, either from the carpenter or the cabinet maker, the actual wood they're going to use, and we start a sample process. So you can see I have masked off this uh, top section here. This is bare wood. I want them to see what the bare wood looks like. We will apply stain, and then I'll mask the stain off, and then we'll apply two coats of varnish, masking the two coats off like that. And then you'll see a stepped out sample board with bare, stain, varnish one, and varnish two, sanding between coats. This is then given to the client for approval. They will actually sign off that this is exactly what they want. And then we will have this on site when we stain and varnish as a sample. So when we have a piece of baseboard like this that's stained, we'll actually hold the standard up to it like this and make sure that it's a match. And once the client approves that, we actually have a sign off sheet for stain and varnish wood that says some very specific non-negotiable things. Like if you pick a softwood like poplar, it will blotch. There are no exceptions. And I actually physically use the word no exceptions. So I want people to know exactly what they're getting. If they don't want to pop for real hardwood, which won't blotch, then you're going to just have to deal with it. It's kind of the way of the world. And uh, we can give clients an amazing finish, an amazing color, an amazing experience. But if we set improper expectations, if we get popular and say, oh, no, I'm just going to eliminate blotching. It's going to be beautiful. You're setting yourself up for failure. And you have to be honest with your clients about the materials they spec and the finishes they want. So here we have two pieces of stained wood here. I'm going to show you two methods of varnish application a little later, brush and spray. But I thought I would go through a couple methods of staining. And I picked these two poplar boards specifically. Any, uh, any craftsperson who's watching knows exactly why. Because there are two different grains on the same kind of wood. You can see this one here. There's a big difference between we're, we're dipping into the heartwood here, the darker wood, the harder wood, and then there's the sap wood, which is the lighter wood, the softer wood. And there, you're gonna see a big color difference in there. I pick poplar because you know, like I said, it's one of the most prevalent woods that we uh, stain and varnish in the company because it's relatively inexpensive. I picked it also because there's a wild variation in the color. You can have gray streaks, green streaks, brown, white. This one's a lot more even. You can see this, it's a uh, more even grained and everything else. It just got cut of a section of the tree that was more even and didn't pop into the heartwood and sapwood. The interesting thing is when you look at a piece of wood like this, these woods have similar, you can see the cut. This came from the same board, give or take like this. So what you're seeing is here's the brown heartwood. Here's the sapwood, and after you stain it, brown hardwood and sapwood, and it looks a lot different. And that's why I pick different pieces of wood to give to the client during the sample process to make sure they, they know what they're getting. Now, if you were to pick this piece, you're going to get a nice, even uh, finish like this. You're not going to see much different there. There's a little bit of hardwood in the corner there. I normally would pick a piece like this to give to the client as a sample. That's why when we do samples, I pick three or four pieces of wood, I stain and varnish them, and a lot of times I'll bring them all to the client just to show them a difference. But when you have a piece of wood, oh, mirror, I'm sorry, when you have a piece of wood like this with hardwood and sapwood, this will be the best indication to the client of what it's gonna look like. You'll say, here's the range, what you have. Here's the light, here's the dark. I don't know what every piece of wood looks like in the house, but you're gonna get all sorts of variations of this. So just be prepared. All right, applications of staining. Let's talk about performance series state. Like I said, it's tintable. They can do custom color matches with this stuff, which is really awesome. So one of the biggest assets I have in my company is my Sherwin Williams store, because I can take them a piece of something like this. I can take them a picture that a client sends me. I drop off some wood and they can actually custom match and they actually make a, a stain sample for me. I usually then take that stain sample back, replicate it two or four different ways and then get approval for the client. So with performance series stains, fully dry, fully dry in about eight hours, but yet you can recoat uh, with solvent varnish in two hours or water-based varnish, which is a pretty cool thing in about six hours, give or take. So um, you have a lot of modularity here because sometimes uh, with the tintable stains that you still have to have a solvent, but a client will spec a water-based finish, uh, maybe for its water whiteness, uh, give or take. 
Any solvent born like this, performance series fast dry varnish, it's going to yellow over time. Uh, this stuff actually doesn't do that very much. There are varnishes that amber or golden or yellow a lot. This one doesn't do that. It imparts a beautiful richness to the wood. But if a client wants that crystal clear water white kind of finish that doesn't amber or yellow over time, you can use a water-based finish uh, about six hours after that, So, which is really cool. Um, yeah, so two methods of, um, two methods of applying stain. Uh, we have brush right here. Uh, we're going to crack this guy open. I have just shaken this up. Now, I uh, because we do a lot of like ebonizing and black stains and very dark stains, for this demo, I just thought we'd do something pretty cool, which is a, a deep navy blue, because I want people to understand the, de uh, the depth and breadth of these colors. Like, yes, you can get ambers, you can get uh, grays, you can get all this other stuff, but a lot of people don't realize you can get reds, greens, blues, yellows, oranges, all those other kind of colors like that. So on the sample here, um, what you want to do is apply to saturation and wipe off before it's dry. If this stain dries, it'll actually leave a layer of pigment on top that'll actually be blotchy and, and leave brush strokes and things like that. So Typically, stain goes a very long way. It's relatively thin, so you don't want to go at it like it's paint. I just take a little dab on the brush like this. And typically, when we stain, I go for edges and things first. I'm going to move this guy out of the way. I'm going to, I'm going to saturate the, the board end here, some end grain. When I do my samples, I like it to be done all the way around for aesthetics. And then I'll do the edges. And one thing you'll know about solvent-borne stains like this is that they apply very easily. And uh, because they are solvent, they have a little bit of uh, uh, oil in them. They actually apply on, they glide on very easy. All right. And again, you're not, you're not going crazy back and forth because stain is relatively thin and you don't want it to blotch or, uh, excuse me, spit. And one of the things you have to be careful for when you do samples is that you don't over apply. Uh, it's very easy. Uh, typically people, the, the most difficult things with stain samples is getting the stain dark enough. You have to put a lot of pigment on there. So there's this tendency for people to apply stain super heavy and leave it on a very long time to try to uh, let it get deeper as it goes. But remember, you have to do this sample like you do in the field, which is in about one or two minutes, you need to be wiping this off because that replicates the, um, sort of uh, 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 scenario that you're going to be doing in the field. So I like to wipe right away. And typically what we'll use is lint free cotton rags. You can just get them in bulk anywhere. Uh, this happens to be from Sherwin as well. So, and then again, same process, wipe the edges like this, wipe the front and you have to be careful of you can see the blotchiness like this from the rag. You have to be careful to get all the stain off because in a stain that's heavily pigmented like this, you can actually leave brush strokes, rag marks, things like this. And it's very important to not sit here and burnish and burnish and burnish. You can actually change the, uh, the look of the wood. So my typical wiping technique is to quick get all the stuff off and then give it one quick extra wipe just to make sure there's no brush or rag marks. Now, Safety with this stuff, I'm gonna put this over here. Safety with this stuff is anytime you have a rag uh, that's dipped into anything solvent born, paint thinner, stain, finish, anything else, uh, the standard operating procedure in my company is actually to have a, a can full of water on site, and then you actually dump that rag in the water like this. Why do we do this? To prevent spontaneous combustion. Um, I have only seen this once in my life. We actually use a uh, part of our uh, proprietary safety training in my company is talking about uh, spontaneous combustion. If you were to take a whole bunch of oily rags and put them in a bucket like this with no water, because they're in a confined area, when that oil evaporates, it actually imparts heat and so much heat that it can actually start on fire with no spark or no ignition source. Like I said, I've only seen it once in my career. It was actually done, I don't know, it was probably 14 years ago or so on a new construction site where there was a person who had a whole bunch of oily rags and a five gallon bucket and it started smoking in the middle of the site. And I quickly took it out and uh, filled it full of a bunch of snow and stuff like that. So it was actually a really weird experience. So literally this is very important. If you were to just take a rag with a whole bunch of stain on it, even throw it in a trash can or it falls to the corner of the shop, it could ignite and spontaneously combust. So make sure you are, uh, yeah, make sure you're doing the right things you need to do. So yeah, that's staining right there. Now let's talk about finishing. 
cap my stain. Okay, with the brush. Now, finishing. Typically, oh, I'm going to move my can here. Finishing. Uh, Performance Series Fast Dry Varnish. I like things that are beautiful, fast drying, and replicable, and don't give you any problems. So typically when we have a, uh, a, a solvent born stain and a solvent born finish, I don't run into all the crazy uh, things that you get with high chemistry finishes. We don't get fish eyes, we don't get crackling, we don't get crazing, we don't get blushing like you do in lacquers and things like that. Um, one of the most traditional, long-standing, uh, easy to apply and most beautiful finishes is a sort of alkyd or solvent born varnish like this. So you can apply finish in a, in a couple of ways here. And I'm gonna move this and I'll actually show you here. So this is when we do stain samples, we just use some broad tape on this stuff. We step our finishes up like that. So you can see we have our bare wood, we have this just to show the client what it looks like. And then I'll show you a couple techniques. A couple techniques of varnishing then too. So we have the ability to hand varnish in this company. We typically don't use rollers. Sometimes it can impart little micro bubbles and things like that. And usually has to be back, back brushed anyway. So what we can do is use uh, either brushes uh, like we did with a stain or we can use a spray. So the brush application is pretty straightforward. You just apply like you do normally. Uh, the spray application, we prefer airless. Uh, like this over here. And uh, one of the good things is you don't have to amend, you don't have to alter, you don't have to change any of this stuff here. So uh, typically uh, what we do is best case scenario, we allow stain to dry overnight. It just feels like a good thing to do. You can certainly push the recoat times. I've done all sorts of experiments with uh, things outside of the technical data sheets. And when you're doing solvent and solvent, the worst thing that can happen if you apply too soon is that all the oil just takes a little longer to dry. Sometimes the varnish can stay a little tackier. Worst case scenario, you just let it dry for a whole bunch of days. Obviously, we don't want to do that because we want to keep on a tight timeline with a lot of our finishes. But uh, four to six hours uh, dry time typically, but you can recoat a uh, fast dry varnish in as little as three hours, which is cool. Now, there are two uh, tests of dryness, which we do. Um, it's sort of like dry to the touch and be able to handle or sandable. And those are two different dry times because you'll see on technical data sheets like dries in X hours or could be recoated in X hours. To me, uh, one of the big tests of a finish and when it's dry is can you sand it? Can you powder it up on something like that? So, yeah, uh, basically, I will show you a spray finish and then we are going to get to uh, any of your questions here like this. And I tell you what I'm going to do here. Uh, I'm going to go grab a brush real quick and I'm going to show you a brush application as well since we're in the shop. One second. Okay, sorry about that. We're going to bump back in here. Let's get our varnish out. Okay, so typically uh, during the staining and varnishing process, I will be wearing a respirator and I will when we spray, but obviously I have to talk to you guys, so we're not going to do that. So again, varnish goes a long way, so you don't need much. And the same process applies here where I'm gonna saturate my ends, especially on poplar, you really wanna apply a ton of finish uh, to the point where uh, you saturate the wood because poplar again is a soft wood soft er wood, and it's gonna take a lot of varnish. And in order to get a beautiful professional finish in two coats, you're gonna to have to apply to the maximum wet mill thickness. If you do a couple light coats, this wood is so porous, it'll accept and absorb the first coat, and then uh, it won't build that beautiful finish uh, if, you, if you don't apply correctly. So again, we have it on, we wipe the sides, and then we do the money side, the face, like this, to make sure that one looks good. Nice brush strokes like that. And then that will dry. Uh, we would typically leave this, yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, we would typically leave this again for, uh, you know, somewhere between two and six hours, give or take, we'll test it. A lot of this has to do with uh, temperature, humidity, and things like that on recoat times. Again, best practice and one of my favorite things to do, just leave it overnight. You know it's gonna be perfectly dry the next day, but sometimes we have to do samples on a short window and we kind of have to push recoat time. So that would typically be that. And now I have one of our airless sprayers. 
has the performance series fast dry in here in it. Make sure that's we will dunk our brush there. Dunk our brush there. And then I'll show you a spray application. So I'll load up my respirator here. And we are in the spray booth today. So typically, when we're doing samples, I would have I would have a whole setup, uh, a spray setup, a swivel, some saugers or something. I would have all the samples laid out. We'd spray them. And if we didn't need the spray booth for another operation, I would just leave them in here to dry. But typically, we have a pretty fast-paced shop, so I would move them into our drying room across the way. But either way, today, I'm just going to hold this one and spray it for you. I should throw on some gloves here so my hands don't get sticky. All right, here we go, a little spray application. Test my pattern. All right. So again, edges first. All right. So what you'll find uh, typically when you spray varnish on stuff like this is, um, what I like about solvent varnish is you can see a tiny bit of orange peel and you can actually see little specks of like wood fibers and things like that there. Uh, that is completely normal. And uh, unlike paint, uh, paint will typically, paint will typically have these, oops, got a little craziness going on here. Uh, paint can sometimes get contaminated with little bits of stuff like this, but you gotta remember solvent borne finishes and things like that will actually penetrate the wood a lot more than, than paints and enamels. And a lot of this stuff will be, uh, it'll incorporate. Uh, the first layer of stain and finish will actually incorporate itself into the top layer of the wood. And then when it all dries, you can actually come back with some uh, fine grit sanding paper, 200, 220. And then you actually knock down all that stuff. Because anytime you impart water uh, and solvent and other things into wood, you're going to raise the grain a little bit. Waterborne has a, has a really big time doing this. Uh, it, it raises a lot of grain. Uh, that's one of the reasons we don't use a lot. Solvent will do it just a little. But the good thing is it encapsulates that top layer of wood and you can actually scuff sand it, make it beautifully smooth. And that, then the wood is perfectly sealed. So when you put on your second coat of varnish, you will not get that raised grain and it'll just layer over the top, beautiful finish. But you can see I put on as thick as you possibly can in order for that stuff to you know soak in and do what it needs to. So, yeah. all right, let's get to some questions here. See what we all got today. Man, thank you everybody for watching. We're going on Instagram here as well too. Thank you all for joining me early here. All right, let's see what we got. Oh man, thanks. Frank, good to see you. Travis Contreras, good morning. Angel, Phil Klein, my good friend. Oh, Cynthia Reynolds, good morning, Nick. Thanks for keeping staining and varnishing alive. I nearly cry when I see beautifully grained woods painted over. Thank goodness no one painted the wood in the Silsby Mansion. Do you ever touch uh, on the topic of shellac for historic homes? Uh, I'll be watching. Yes. So this is a weird little niche thing, uh, traditional wood finishes. So uh, I am a huge fan of historic stuff and traditional finishes. And shellac is one of the most uh, historic finishes in my area. Typically, a lot of the homes that were built uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, which are my favorite uh, era of, uh, of homes, they were in my area were typically finished with shellac, uh, which is actually a really cool finish. It is a, the excrement, historically, the excrement of a beetle, I think, in Southwest Asia that kind of like you know, it climbs on trees and it excretes this substance and makes little tunnels for itself. People come by, scrape that uh, excrement off and they actually dissolve it in rubbing alcohol or denatured alcohol. And that's what makes a, a finish like that, um, that resins get into, um, into suspension and you actually apply that like that. Uh, you can buy shellac um, in, uh, in liquid form. You can also buy it in flake form, which is really cool. You can get a little baggie of uh, shellac flake, mix it up yourself like that, which is really cool. Now, shellac is cool. Uh, historic home people love it. I will tell you this. It is not a great wood finish. <laughs> I, in, in, in my process of finishing, uh, uh, maybe a decade ago, what I used to do is stain wood. I used to apply shellac to all of it because it dries almost instantly. Uh, every layer you put on incorporates into the next one and it sands just beautifully. The problem is two things. 
it's brittle. It is brittle. You can see in these old hundred year old houses, it is so brittle that when the wood moves, all the shellac alligators, and you can actually walk up to the shellac and shave it off with your finger. So it, it yes, this is a hundred years later, but still it is a brittle finish. Number two reason why I don't use shellac regularly, it doesn't stand up to water at all. There is no exterior rated use for shellac at all, except one thing, pigmented shellac, the white shellac sometimes can be used for knot holes outside, but I would say that's not even worth it. It's too brittle. You can use an uh, oil-based um, uh, primer for that sort of thing. So now Cynthia, I love it. I have done shellac finishes. We've restored shellac finishes. Um, people, people love it because it's historic and it touches on that thing. And it's fine. You can use it in your house, but you have to be prepared for uh, it dries really fast. It's tough to get an even uh, professional finish over large areas. Uh, and it can be dissolved by alcohol. So if you're finishing historic shellac with new shellac, that new shellac will actually dissolve the old shellac a lot of the times. And you can run into some gummy problems and sometimes it can even strip if you're not applying it correctly. So it's a tricky finish. I love it, but it's just kind of one of those, like for anybody who knows, I do have some Aska painters on traditional finishes where we actually mess around with like fuming wood uh, with ammonia to, to change the color dyeing wood, shellacs, I mean, milk paint, all sorts of those weird calcimimes and things like that. Uh, they're just, they're, they're interesting and niche. We just don't have a, a use for them regularly in my professional life like that. But Cynthia, I love it. Frank, thanks for all the info. Those processes can be intimidating. Absolutely. What kind of top coat would you recommend for oak flooring? Uh, Minwax actually has a, a bang up uh, flooring finish, a polyurethane that I've actually used in my old house too. And it was awesome. My kids tried to beat the living heck out of my floors and uh, that stuff held up really well. So uh, check your Sherwin-Williams uh, with Minwax. Uh, it's super easy to apply too. I've brushed floors with that. I have rolled floors with that. I've sprayed floors with that and it's a phenomenal product. So, all right, Seth Hotstetter. What do you mean technically when you say blotching? Good question. Let's see if I can find a example. Okay, good example here on the piece that we just stained. So you see these areas here that are a little darker than the others, these ribbons, these ribbons right here. Um, I know that this is what uh, Poplar does when you apply uh, deeper pigmented stains to it. We will have a lot of clients who will look at this and say, hey, I don't like this sample. I want this to go away. I don't want that variation. I want it to be 100% even, smooth, no variations. And that's why we do all the work to set proper expectations, which is when you look at a piece of poplar like this, you cannot predict where that's going to be. That wood is going to do what it's going to do. So it's very important to set proper expectations and say, this is what's going to happen. And from 30 years of doing this, I have not seen an example where it doesn't happen, especially when you're doing a large project. So that would be a good example of what I call blotching. Uh, Pine will do this as well, too. Uh, Seth Hotsetter, varnish versus lacquer. Again, I went deep on science on this stuff uh, for many decades uh, because I actually wanted to know the industry standard uh, for finishing new construction and other things is lacquer. And a lot of it is nitrocellulose lacquer, which is very, very cheap, inexpensive and brittle and doesn't stand up to water. The actual, um, I'm trying to, I, I'm not going to use the right science terms, right? So I actually had the pleasure of spending two days with a uh, PhD chemist who was the owner of a uh, wood finish company, mainly lacquers. And he was a big fan of lacquers. I am too, but they have to have their place. He told me the ball and stick models of the molecules. He also showed me like how the molecules are arranged and their configuration. It actually helped me really understand wood finishing. So when you have lacquer, lacquer molecules are typically long chains of, of things, proteins, molecules. I'm not going to use the right words, but you got to bear with me here. I'll, I'll bring this down into layman's terms as he did for me. Lacquer molecules are long chains of stuff. Oil molecules like this are tiny little balls. And in fact, a, a, a ball, a molecule, a, a bit of substance in oil is sometimes 10 to 20 times smaller than the same ball or molecule in water-based something. So again, when you think about oil-based finishing, think a bag of peas. When you think about water-based finishing, you think a room full of beach balls. And you can imagine a bag of peas has less little gaps and things in it, and they touch a lot of closer, and they're more kind of like they fill in the gaps. A room full of beach balls has some pretty big gaps in there, give or take, uh, with water-based finishing. Lacquer molecules are like a bowl full of spaghetti. And the way he described it to me was because, you know, in, in Minnesota, we have a lot of wood sash windows, Andersons and Marvins. And this lacquer fails within a couple of years. And in fact, you can see lacquer curling off in long ribbons. 
And he said, that's interesting, data plus feelings. Your feelings are, you know what it is to fix that and do that on site. Here's the data behind that, which is lacquer, spraying lacquer on a piece of wood is like taking a bowl full of spaghetti and just dumping it on a table. However that spaghetti lands is how it sits. A lot of it doesn't do a lot of cross-linking, polymerization, things like that. It's more of just like spaghetti lands and there it is. And you're going to get some tight things. You're going to get some good coverage, but you're going to get some big gaps in there as well, too. And those big gaps are where water gets in and then can't get out. Um, lacquer is brittle. Uh, mainly people use it because it dries quick and sands easy. Uh, it, uh, people who are, you know, very low end lacquer finishers, they would never tell you that it's better than conversion varnish, oil varnish, things like that. They would always tell you it's just easier to use, uh, pretty cheap, and then uh, dries quicker. Also, an interesting thing is, have you ever seen uh, blushing or uh, clouding in, in a finish? Like you have a, a nightstand where you have a water ring and it's got a white ring there. That, as that PhD chemist um, explained to me, is water getting through the spaghetti in there and not being able to evaporate back out. So you're actually creating a little cloud underneath there. Now, we're getting deep into nerdy wood finishing stuff. One of the coolest things that I've heard described, but have never done myself, which I'm, I would love to do, uh, there was a guy who used to maintain um, the furniture and the grounds at a very high-end luxury Chicago hotel. It may have been a Ritz-Carlton. Um, and people leave their water glasses on the nightstand and they have white rings. So instead of refinishing them or replacing the thing, what he used to do is pour a little rubbing alcohol on there, light it on fire, and immediately snuff it out with a wet rag. That, that flash fire evaporated the water. Now, this is a beautiful story. I want it to be true. I've never tried it myself, but supposedly you can get rid of uh, water rings with that. Now, obviously high risk, high reward. You're lighting a table on fire to get rid of a minor blemish. And I assume you could do some pretty big damage to it, but I want that story to be true. And I've always dared myself to try it. If I ever find a lacquer side table that had a water ring on it, uh, that was good there. So, all right, that's why I don't use lacquer. Do, 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 do. All right, Gustavo, I've heard of those rags combusting inside vans and vans going on fire. That's exactly it. You have to be careful for that. Uh, Kabir, thank you so much. Austin Isley, how's it going, man? I had an apprentice leave his rags in a cardboard box a few years ago. We showed up the next morning only to find a hole burned in the middle of the floor where the box was. Wow, holy cow, that would have been a bad one. Um, Josh Leonard, in your booth, uh, are you running positive or negative airflow system? So here's how we do. We have an open face booth where we have a, a monstrous, a monstrous uh, air makeup, uh, air handler outside. It's the size of a truck that spits in 70 degree air as fast as this jet engine takes it out. We have an open face booth because it's a production shop like this. Phil, we stain a lot of hickory, which has a ton of variations. So we are very clear with the homeowners. Multiple samples you got. Sumter, how's it going? Mike Danahy, oh, how's it going, man? What grit would you use between varnish coats? So uh, <laughs> this is going to be sort of an unsatisfying answer, which is, uh, so I would, I would probably not use less than 200 or 220, but my favorite between, between sanding, um, between varnish steps to sand is actually a burned out 3M medium grit sanding pad. Like when they're past their useful life as a medium grit sanding pad, they're almost just like used up and depleted. And typically people will throw those away. And I actually think that uh, if I have to compare it to other sandpaper, I think that's probably approaching a 250 to a 300 almost. But I like it because um, if you use a hard sanding block on a lot of varnished woodwork, you can sometimes burn through edges. So I like those beat up, burned up, depleted uh, 3M sanding blocks like that. And even the surf prep stuff too, where it's got a little bit of squishiness to it and it's probably a 250 to a 300 grit. I find that stuff does a, an amazing job of sanding between coats. So if I had to replicate that, I would get a fine or a super fine uh, medium, uh, uh, a sanding sponge or in the surf prep, they even go past that. that there's pluses, there's super fines, there's other things like that. I would use those. So all right, Mark Johnson, what's your go-to exterior spar varnish? So Mark, a uh, fellow uh, historic restoration friend of mine, uh, honestly, I love the Minwax Helmsman. Uh, I've been using this stuff for at least a decade, give or take, and uh, it dries slow. There's other varnishes that dry quicker, but uh, the finish on it, the satin, is just amazing. Uh, uh, you have to be really careful with site contamination, things like that, but it's easy to apply. We've never had a fisheye. We've never had a crackle. We've never had anything weird like that. We've even had a little bit of rain and sprinkler issues on jobs where it hasn't affected it. But the finish, the finish is just beautiful. When it dries, 
That version of a Minwax Helmsman satin is one of the most beautiful satins I've ever seen. The door almost just like radiates glowing uh, energy from it. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. If you guys not seen it before, I got pictures uh, on my uh, site uh, probably from the last year or two of when we've done doors like that. And it is, it is pretty amazing. So, all right. Good morning, Nick. Have you ever found an efficient way to refinish exterior stain and finish wood soffits? Brad, yeah, absolutely. So, Refinishing can mean a lot of things. It can mean completely stripping down to bare wood and sanding and starting over, which a lot of our clients uh, do not take on because it's very labor intensive and, and expensive. So typically what we'll do is we have uh, some restoration chemicals like uh, sodium hydroxide. Uh, we'll use oxalic acid and we'll do a soft wash uh, with some scrubbing and some things like that. And then the finish we choose we try to find something because we're not going to get all the finish off like that. Uh, so we want to find a finish that incorporates the old finish, but brings the new bare wood up to par and kind of blends everything in. And that's a more acceptable approach for clients. If we could strip everything down to bare wood, you can do that by stripping chemicals or by mechanical sanding. But again, that's super labor intensive. And most clients, when we give them the option, don't don't bump for that. So. Oh, man, I'm mirroring my phone screen on the TV, uh, doing yoga while watching the Escapator, man. That is awesome. This is uh, Dave Pine. The, this is the new breed of contractor out there. It's Saturday morning. We're being intentional, doing yoga, and listening to Escapator. That means a lot to me, man. So, all right, Gustavo, uh, you look a bit tired there, Nick. Yeah, so, well, what you're going to see here is uh, two things. Downlighting uh, will certainly give my face some shadows. Number two, I mean, I'm actually pretty tired. Uh what happened this week was uh, a really interesting week. Uh, Monday was kind of work as normal, get the things done. Uh, Tuesday, I actually had a video shoot all day with a sprayer company. We actually picked one of my job sites. I worked with all my guys. It was very early morning, uh, late into the evening. I actually left Tuesday night from that job site in my painting clothes and went to the airport to fly out to Milwaukee for a pro show. So got into Milwaukee really late, started my day as I always do at 4 a.m. to catch up with work, support my team, uh, did the pro show all day, the speaking, the things, the this, the that, went to the airport, came home, two flight delays, got home in the middle of the night, woke up the next day, did another video shoot with uh, my people on one of our actual job sites, painted all day, talked all day, things like that, came home, <laughs> and then uh, that night, Thursday night, uh, I was, I was going to head to bed early, I was snuggling up with the kids, uh, we all kind of just passed out early and then my, my little baby daughter got sick and I was up till about 1.30 or 2 in the morning uh, Thursday night uh, with that. Uh, then Friday morning, yesterday morning, I got up extra early again and we went to the airport and flew for St. Louis and then I got home last night again, later. Now, <laughs> this if, if life didn't get any stranger, I'm coming home, it's maybe, I don't know, somewhere between 9 and 10 p.m. I'm going down my gravel road. And I come over the crest of the hill. This is my home territory, beautiful evening. And there's two guys walking in the middle of the road, look a little scraggly, a little uh, worse for wear. Come over the hill and they quit. They're walking in the middle of the road, just kind of bebopping and they move over. And this is weird. We're out in the middle of nowhere here on the Slavic farm. We don't typically see young people uh, walking in the road. So, like, oh, that's really interesting. Oh, no worries. I keep going. Right in a field in front of my house, there is a pickup truck tipped over last night. So I call 911 <laughs> last night and uh, I immediately, I turn around, uh, I, I got the deputy on the phone, I get some people over, I check the vehicle for people. There were no people and then two and two come together. We got a couple uh, kids walking down the road, worse for wear. I go back down there, I can't find them. Uh, so I go back to the site and wait for the deputy because they're gonna track me down anyway. And then me and my wife sat out there to make sure those kids uh, eventually came back, we made sure they were okay. And then the deputies did their thing. They tipped the truck back over and they towed it out of there last night. But again, uh, probably got to bed, I don't know, maybe about 11, give or take. So it's been a long week. Uh, I, have a, um, I have a tendency to pack a lot in my schedule, which I love to do, but uh, I do it for a good reason. Uh, support my family, support my people in my business, and then support the industry on this. And, uh, you know, we only have so many years to do this and I get great energy from this and uh, I'm willing to do it. So thanks. You're right. It's been a long week, but it's awesome. And I, and I love this stuff. So <laughs> Richard Heilman. Hey, Nick, great breakdown on the molecules. Oh man, Richard fellow Minnesota painter. Uh, I know and love good to see you, man. Troy Frederick, man, I've been painting my whole life, but where the hell do you go to painting school at? I don't even know <laughs> the science of it. Here's the thing, it's hard to find. The PCA has got amazing resources for everybody, how to paint, how to run a business. But if you want that kind of information and you have a curious mind, you gotta go find it yourself. Literally, 
uh, about 15 years ago, I called every single paint company and basically just kept asking, okay, you know, you call the technical support line, they're always helpful, but they're not the people who created the coatings. They're not the chemists. They're not the R and D people. And then you keep asking questions, asking questions. And if you're, if you're lucky enough to build a relationship with some of these companies like Minwax and Sherwin and things, they'll actually connect you with the nerds with the thick glasses who sit in those lab coats and actually make these things. And I have literally had the privilege uh, because I'm a loudmouth on social media. I have a curious mind and I keep asking questions. Eventually they will say, Oh my God, you need to talk to Jim. Jim's been our product developer for 30 years. He actually came up with all that stuff. He tested everything. And Jim is a paint nerd too. He would love to talk to you, but you don't normally get that person on the first day. You got to keep calling, keep asking questions and be curious uh, about that sort of thing. So uh, let's see. Richard Heilman, well-spoken, hate lacquer myself for many reasons, been the same. Uh, users fall in love with the dry time, not the overall quality. That is one of the most eloquent summaries of uh, shellac-based finishes I've heard, Richard. Well said. Uh, da, 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 da. Never try and never stop learning. <laughs> Mike McGrath, how's it going, man? V Prentice, a painter OG taught me to sand poly with a paper bag between coats. Brown bagging. Yes. So we don't sand that between coats. That's actually uh, a super historic painter technique where you take brown bag, a flurry paper or something like that. And we call it brown bagging. And we do that uh, if there's any site contamination, specks of things in the finish. When it's done, you can actually very lightly burnish it. It's probably like an 8,000 grit sandpaper, the equivalent there. Um, do, 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 do. And, uh, and it actually can get rid of some surface contamination. It doesn't work as well for enameled stuff, but for stained and varnished stuff, I will, I will challenge you, get some, uh, get some floor paper out, get a shopping bag, a paper bag thing. Try brown bagging uh, your stained and varnish work sometime. It is an amazing thing and it doesn't mar the finish at all like that. So, all right. Lauren Fink, good friend, Lauren Fink. What a great dose of wood finishing vitamins. I would agree. I, this, this stuff gives me a lot of energy. Typically, I would never have a chance to, uh, to go do a finish like this. Uh, for a client, uh, especially with uh, the dark blue. But you can see that uh, the finish is already tacking up to the touch and soaking into the wood like this. And you're going to see, you know, all those little bumps and nibs and things like that. That's the actual wood fibers raising the grain a little bit. When this is dry, that stuff beautifully knocks down and powders up. So I get a lot of energy from this stuff. This is a lot of fun. So do, 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 do. Brad, thank you. Exactly what I was expecting to hear, but wanted to hear it from someone else's. Confirmation. It's fun when you get something confirmed. Data plus feelings, right? Uh, da, 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 da. Kabir. I so much achieved in this video. Good to hear you, Kabir. Kabir's been watching some videos lately. Good to interact with you. Uh, yeah, Lauren, what a week. Uh, <laughs> Oh man, you guys are very kind here. So I tell you what, speaking of supporting the industry, we're setting up a healthcare for our employees through the Painting Contractors Association next month. Yeah, that's one of the cool freaky things about the PCA. Uh, the PCA um, membership, Painting Contractors Association, maybe 400 bucks a year, a buck a day, give or take. But it is, what people don't understand about that is it's underwritten hugely by the industry, by all our industry partners, the coding manufacturers. It should be two or three times that uh, for the value that you get. Um, our big industry partners actually give hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to that industry in order to bring the cost of these things down so we can actually get them out to the industry. And uh, it's an amazing thing out there. One of the things, uh, my and Jason's mission for the next couple of years is to take all these awesome resources, which honestly, if I'm being honest, nobody really knows about except us. We're the weirdos here. Nobody really knows about the PCA. There's 1,100 members in an industry of 300,000 painters. Like we need to do a better job of getting it out. And that's going to be our mission for the next couple of years, which is people don't know that we have health insurance, negotiated group health insurance, the real stuff, not some weird, exotic, catastrophic, Aflac kind of stuff. This is legitimate gold, sta gold standard private health care that when you're a member, you get this discounted rate with tons of options. You have a Sherpa to help you through it and you can employ this for your company. You can recoup, recoup the cost and then some of private health insurance, which I, which I enacted years ago versus the PCA's health insurance. And uh, you also have somebody to help you with it, which is an amazing thing. And I wish people knew about it. And that's going to be our goal uh, going forward here. So uh, da, 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 da. Lauren Fink, uh, imperfect poly look after two coats on a stained pine ceiling. How would you go back and fix? Ooh, it depends, Lauren. It depends on the imperfection. If it's orange peel on the finish, that would be a sort of sand out. 
if the finish looks blotchy, you may just need another coat. Sometimes SVT, sand vac tack, uh, you sand lightly with a you know, fine or medium grit. You vacuum off the dust and then you use a microfiber tack rag cloth uh, with water to get it off and then put another coat. If it's blotchy looking and it doesn't really look like a nice, beautiful, even finish, you may just need to SVT and throw another one on. If, the, if there's actual finished flaws, fish eyes, crackling, sagging, uh, orange peel, things like that, then you probably just need to sand those out. But again, it's a delicate process because if you sand through, you may burn through the stain and then you have a, a color issue as well too. So Richard, brown bagging, in my experience, will add a bit of sheen, uh, whereas sandpaper, even the finest, uh, will chalk and doll. Absolutely, man. That's exactly it. So, okay, everybody, uh, right now, I want everybody to do me a favor. Share this. I know you're watching on Instagram. I know you're watching on Facebook. Facebook is the easier way to do this. Please, the kindest thing you can do right now is to share this show on your platform. We want to find more like-minded, aggressive, progressive paint business entrepreneurs and master crafts people around the country. And we want them to connect them to this. Not because I have all the answers, but because you, oh, a mirrored image. I'm looking at my uh, uh, message feed right here because you guys are here and I want everybody to connect. There's people like Lauren who just popped up within the last year. She's curious. She reached out to me because you know, people eventually trip over me because I'm a loudmouth in the industry on social media. We connect and she's one of the most inspiring people I've ever met in this industry. She's only been here for a year. This is what the power of this and the PCA and all of this, uh, all of us contractors coming together. So please share this, like this, follow Ask a Painter, and tell somebody else about this if you think they would benefit from the interaction that we have here and these other events. So, all right, people, uh, Saturday morning routine with my family. My kids are done with school. We're headed out to a farmer's market to assemble a meal that we can eat on a Saturday night, bum around. Uh, this morning, I think we're picking the Northfield Farmer's Market. We will see. And then... Um, if you guys follow along, uh, Monday is Memorial Day, and I will be doing all my cemetery visits with the VFW, the Veterans of Foreign Wars. We'll be reading the names of deceased veterans. Um, we will be playing taps. We've got the honor guard with all the flags and everything else, and it's a beautiful, beautiful day. There's a parade in town, which we haven't had in a bunch of years. New Prague has a brand new Veterans Memorial, which is absolutely amazing. So I would urge everybody... Uh, if you can observe it, great. Uh, it's not just a day for barbecues and things like that, although we will do that eventually. But uh, if you can make it out and support those veterans, uh, me and them would really appreciate it. So, all right, everybody, you guys are awesome. Like and share the show. Have a good weekend. This is family time, and I appreciate you guys spending with me on a Saturday morning.